Okay, you know these Egyptian stone bowls that we've been referring to, and a lot of people, ooh parts, they could be made by aliens, it just comes out of nowhere, mankind's technology. Seems like we just don't give ourselves enough credit sometimes. We're going to get into this here, so you might want to grab a cup of coffee and pause it, grab one and come back to it here. Real interesting thing to me on these is this Dalmatian looking rock that they selected probably for a reason that it was beautiful. Are these ones that look like creamsicle cinnamon and all the blotchy forms of them. What I really thought was so interesting was that one rock is harder than another in this. It's not a granite that's just finite like small little dots in between and overall it looks a little pink granite or so on it's something that's like this and yet they were able to polish each of those two individually to a certain point it's a lot more ooh parts with it and make no bones about it like the thing on here on the left where they took a crystal type of bowl here where it's actually translucent and see-through and less than an eighth of an inch thick all the way around and through that's still a marvel of technology. It can't be denied by what I'm going to show today. But I'm going to make some connections and we're going to go back, oh, 6500 BC. Nay, no, I'm going to go ahead and attach it to 10,500 BC and I'm going to run it back to the time of the Younger Dryas event. No, man, I'll be damned. I'm going to take it to 22,000 years ago and actually show you the origins of humanity making these bowls. What really blows me away about it is, you know, kind of whatever I was brought up, these things weren't mentioned really, and then all of a sudden they pop up like popcorn. And there's been archaeological sites that have had these show up. But that was after the fact and nobody's putting two and two together still to this day in fact when they show an anomaly like that they want to attach aliens as we've said to it i want you to remember that bowl right there and the way that it looks and its conical shape the egyptians were known for taking and putting these little shapes and holes in the ground so this thing could set in there they weren't making the bowl so it set out and had a real good it could topple over when they would make them to where they had a dent to go into them. A lot of the pottery that they had, too, had these little pointed shapes on the end of them, and that's what those set down in. And there are no shortage of pieces of these that are either bowls and so on. And see, this doesn't have the tabs on it. This is like one of my favorites, but there's about 40 pieces that look like this that seem to be made out of this cinnamon cream sickle look. I always revert back to whenever I was a kid and I always can remember whenever I saw something first in times and so on. And I remember seeing these in a picture book and one just like this about seventh grade. Now I was in an advanced art class where we actually got to do ceramics. And in those ceramics, you would paint these glazes on. And I remember some of them looking like mud. Although they, we work with mud, if you will, if you know what I'm talking about. But you'd fire this thing, and then you've got to paint it. And whenever you did, you'd paint it on there. And whenever it fired, it would turn a totally different color. And there was also a lot of these um, colors that you could put on that were a swirly thing. that was real popular back in the 60s, all the way through the 70s, and somewhat still popular today. And having a comeback in art in a look of this swirled look but it had little bitty chips of glass all in the paint too and you shook it up real good and put it on and it sometimes looked like a purplish brown glob with little sand speckles all over it and you only did it to the edge of the lip the inside you painted with another type if you were going to try to drink out of it you could even put a little gold patina lip around it and they have stuff that makes it look like aged bronze I made my mom a few things at Christmas and things like that that she had through the years and I inherited back whenever she passed away. But 
you'd fire this thing that looked like it was covered with mud with speckles and grit all in it and whenever it came out it would look like that and it was incredible definitely had that 60s look especially you know when you see the screen behind him it's all it kind of has that idea and you could get all these different colors mixed together and some would fight the other colors and create swirls and drips and things like that that was real neat some of these alabaster bowls they made i've said though are less than an eighth of an inch thick and it looks like they selected these ones especially to be able to look at the swirls cutting through like you can see this bowl here where it's cutting through and they wanted that and this thing's about a little bit bigger than a frisbee that you would commonly use but if you look at the rim and the way the thing's made it's just like a frisbee extremely thin so there's still an incredible amount of craftsmanship beauty everything done to this being able to shape something like this and it's translucent they got it under the light it shows up but while they have this going on what's strange is they only have a few examples of stuff like this one that's kind of green here it got painted with a green paint but in comparison this is like a what the hell and this is stone it's not pottery you can imagine pottery coming out like that sometimes and so on but no that's not so i want you to remember that as we go through this here in a minute or continue as we go on see there's the anomalies that they do is where they take the thing on the left like alabaster and they've got it so thin an eighth of an inch thin that when the sun shines through it it glows and stuff that's something we would desire so much today in the way something was made and it was like all oh, these people were pulling it back then it looked like they just cut it right out of a rock of alabaster the whole thing and cut it all out well, no, there was a lot of handiwork and hand craftsmanship going. And I've got another vid showing a girl actually trying to pull this off and doing a pretty damn good job, but she really only pulls off something that's like the one I showed you recently that was found at Ayanlar Hoya, which is one of the Gobekli Tepe sites dating at least 9600 B.C. in a layer that they have associated with pre-pottery neolithic some of those sites that are buried over now are not even really showing any pottery they're preemptive to it but yet there's this bowl there because here's the anomaly that i'll take back twenty thousand years people didn't start with pottery that's made out of clay they were making bowls out of stone Kind of in a weird way like fred flintstone and some kind of crap that you'd think but you look at this craftsmanship and it's incredible the one on the right right there or center really you can tell that they picked it because it had speckles in a cascade going down to it and it looks like a galaxy or a reverse galaxy if you were to take a picture and make a negative of it it almost looks like a galaxy in it and it's an eighth of an inch thick but then just to show off i'm guessing you can see that center punch that's in here and these people had something like a lathe i'll show you that craftsmanship not in this video the other one and i'll probably release them together so there isn't a big wait or anything in between probably right after this one thinking about it but look at how this looks like they just heated this up and then fold it over like it's a piece of tortilla They have those schist bowls we're talking about, and there, there are no shortage of these, by the way. There's like over 40,000. There's like a good amount of them in this museum and that museum and that museum, and then they've got hundreds of them at the Egyptian Museum and thousands that are still just packed all up that they don't even bring out. Over 40,000 of these were found in one place, and I'm going to talk about that and the fact that that was a heritage situation, like they talk about being a heritage civilization in a different way than people usually do. See that bowl, bowl on the left? Not as well made, huh? But that's stone, but it looks like pottery, and they even red ochred it. That schist bowl is not alone. The one that looks like a steering wheel with the pedals in there looks like some kind of turbo fan. You can find things like I showed a minute ago with the Dalmatian Galaxy one. 
this one you can easily discern the circle in the center of it and the fact that they tortilla peeled this one in too. If they had them flanged and arched up on each one of these, you could see how they could put that on something and spin and churn water and do things like that. And yeah, they had Archimedes screw for water and things before that. Made a video way earlier this year showing you, well, the Sumerians had it. In fact, it was the method used in, the, in Babylon. So apparently that predates this thing. But it's accredited to Greeks like they found it again because it was apparently a lost technology. One of the things that helped make that another picture of that same one i love these alabaster ones where it's just totally see-through all tiger striped and stuff and dalmatians and what colors you can get out of it and you can see they've made a lot of different shapes some things are real common but these ones and of course these tabs on here keep you from being able to make this on a lathe unless you left that area real thick and did everything else on it and then you had to do this by hand but then match it and that becomes the real thing. Now I've looked on a few of these and you can kind of see an essence of them doing it and trying to cover up the fact that they ever did. But there are stone bowls found in Sumeria and over in, well, all the way to the edge of Maluha as they called it, but that would be Upper India. Zagros Mountains and cultures that are there. Look at this plate when you look down on it. That's just like see-through and wicked. This is at the Getty Museum. We saw this out in L.A. when we went out there. This is made from agate. A giant deposit of agate. And they uh, did the same thing with it. Now it's Roman times. I don't know if it's showing up well in there. I want to zoom in on this. Well, it's starting to go to crap, so I'll just go there light shining into it and it's just agate with all those swirls a lot of times you see cameos made out of things okay this is that a gigantic bowl made out of it well it's pretty good size you know but anyhow uh so to get onto the point we see what we're looking at and they scratch the names in there and they go man they can make a bowl like this but they only scratch that good well there's something different about it you gotta be real careful when you're picking at something that's this thinned off here, though, is one that's not quite perfectly shaped. It doesn't look like this thing over here on the right. It's, it's you know, and all the other ones I've shown you, it's, it's another one of those. Not quite as bad as that green one we were looking at, I want you to remember. But there are other ones. They made these others, you know, in pottery and things, too. So, and, and blue faience covered stuff. Even this spout that's here. There are ducks that are made out of this same Dalmatian type stuff that are pretty incredible. Oh, there's that green stone again. Glad it showed up. So, in remembrance of that, let's look at something else. Just, just uh, you know, here's a piece of pottery. Over here. And I've shown you and you've seen bowls that are made like that. And even a little fluted more. That one that was real see-through Dalmatian alabaster looking. Definitely on that. Remember this. Just like we did that very first one I'm talking about. And then this. Which really looks like that one in the girls thing that I'm going to show you. The thing that doesn't make any sense is here's one made out of crystal rock crystal bowl that early look at this pink one that's here too i mean some of these have been selected just for the stone and things like that and i guess i want to what i want to show you is they're making pottery at this time that's pretty badass here's a good piece of it right here and you can tell that they made it look childish almost by the way that it's painted on it doesn't look like perfect lines across it and they they are able to make perfect lines and they don't they just kind of cross grid half of it make it look like a cross grid and half of the other half has a symbol of a cow and then this is a Sumerian symbol of din gear and it means gods it's kind of that same form you could say it's a bunch of reeds together that are all crossed one way but that's also the Din Gear symbol. That's where it comes out of. 
See this little bowl that guy's got a hand on right there, too? And there was one more thing I wanted to show. Oh, did you know the ancient Egyptians used to go bowling? Here's something, too. Two more that give you give away this thing that I'll show you. Where well, these are not made so well. Like, later they're able to make things that are not so well. So there's a craftsmanship that I'm not going to really refer to. Look at how thin this thing is. It's thinner than that schist disc, and it's just all like, well, yeah, there's some chips knocked out of it. Yeah, look how it was originally made. That's just freaking incredible. And they figure it had this thing in the center of it, I guess, which is cracked up in pieces, too. Look at this bowl here. Okay, I better start getting on to it, but I did want to show you one more ideal about how they had... Have, had to have a wheel and a potter's wheel. Oh, well, here's something funny. See, there's a, something they found. I did a video about this about three years ago, one of my 420 series. And uh, they sa keep saying that these are coffee ground catchers for strainers for coffee and doing this, that, and the other. That's the top of a hookah, and they use it to smoke out of. What are they smoking? Oh, they had pot. They definitely had pot. But, you know, they found tobacco in with Ramses and so on. And it was a pretty high level of nicotine in him, too. And cocaine, which comes from the New World. So, you know, giraffe cultures again here and stuff that's over from Sumeria, right? So, we're, God, I wanted to throw that in so we'd mention it. There's none of those stone bowls that they found or the hookah thing. And here's a stone bowl that's not quite perfect. It's almost perfect up and down like a cup. Way too big to be a cup, though. Kind of heavy. Anyhow, there was this one thing that shows grinding around on it, and you can tell, well, it had to have been done. Here it is right here. You can tell it had to have been done by spinning on a lathe with carving. And what's strange is this bowl's cut off halfway, so it was spinning on its side. And they did this one, they did this one, they did that one. And it's about impossible to make perfect things like that. You could have taken an object like a comb and worked through something like this. But this was spinning also whenever they start at the center and work their way down and make those lines. Here's another jug, cauldron, kind of made out of there. And see, some of these depths that it goes into, like down and in and these things, shows you that they the object has to be able to get down in there that's bigger than this to carve that we'll get to that in the other video really and uh so i think that's about it for that and uh oh so here's those uh hookah bowls large clay bowls yeah um and how it works so we saw those tapered bowls and all the other kind of it now we're going to go to look at a preemptive site showing you the connections of the people that were pre-dynastic that were making this stuff and kept it for hundreds if not thousands of years perfecting it and family cherished heirlooms I think and then at one point the strange oddity is they decided to give it away Because we've talked about the Natufians quite a few times. And so if we look at their sites here that it shows, this was a concentration. This is an outdated map too. And there's more sites up the coast a little bit. And then down into the Klitsch that's here. And down here and more into the Sinai. And of course they're going to mention Egypt and so on too. So this might have been sites for one period of time than what, what they had. There are a lot of these sites. Now, when I took my archaeology classes and stuff, there were only a few of these known. And a couple of the others, but they weren't putting connectives together and so on. And they didn't even have really the concept. And because they called it Natufians in some of the cultures that are hooked up with... Um, Jericho and so on making the face masks which we might look at here later um, didn't pulled out their front teeth 
and all I want for Christmas is my two front teeth kind of idea and they pulled that out to allow for all their other teeth come in so they didn't have any problems with their wisdom teeth right and so I thought maybe Natufians haha but no it's Wadi El Natuf yeah I got by with that joke a few times in class but Abu Herrera we talked about also as being a place that was destroyed and it's here off the Euphrates here leading up into Anatolia and it's a place that was destroyed at the Younger Dryas event where there was two or three that hit on the North American ice shelf perhaps one out in the water or blew up over the water which would have been ice covered too at the time but it, then it appears one made it all the way to Iceland and did make a crater. And we call that Hiawatha Crater. And it's like 32 kilometers across. Pretty huge, but it's got ice glacier covering it now. But then some other piece apparently came and went all the way across. So we had this bam, bam, bam. And one went ah, all the way around here. Ah, bam. And blow up over it and it seemed to have been made out of comets because it seems comets can't handle when they start breaking up into our atmosphere thank god or they would cause more problems but they explode and cause air bolides up in the air and it still causes incredible things like the sea of glass that's out in libya that i've talked about that king touch jewelry was made out of and so on so we'll get to some pictures here in a minute let's just uh brush up on this Natufian culture late epi paleolithic archaeological culture dating around 15,000 to 11,500 years ago in many of those sites but it spreads and there's a time before and a time after and they due to this bowl and a few other things that they carry down here will try today to make enough a connection where you can see the people of Gobekli Tepe and that culture are attached to these and they end up becoming proto-dynastic Egyptians and that's where the whole bowl things come from because they got them too so the Natufian culture at uh, Abu Herrera is the site of the earliest evidence of agriculture in the world that's the one that they're accepting now but there are dates and showings that they were doing it more but rather not dedicated but they were also wiped out and it's also in addition uh, to being the oldest evidence of bread making has been found at Chabka which is 14,500 years old site in Jordan's northeastern desert but in between this getting posted to that and now I've made a video showing 16,800 bread and another grinding tool showing oats so it could have been oat bread or something along that line which they all figured it was firing it up and so on it's about 26,000 years old and another site that showed but it isn't near this old that showed a, a type of uh, rye bread biscuits or whatever that they had in the fire but it only dates at about 9,600 but it was one of the other things on the site so at least 14,500 and if that would you would say was be modern day bread because it was made out of wheat in addition it's the oldest known evidence of beer dating to approximately 13,000 years before present or 11,000 years BC and see they can't find any evidence of it before because the stone bowl, bowl people that we're talking about here actually used to keep a lot of their liquids and it happened for thousands of years past the time we're talking about and you know it well even into the times of the pioneers of the west of the United States inside animal skins and so on so there's no evidence of that anymore those rot away real hard it would be hard to find even fragments of a piece and then say well this was the inside and outside get a swab off the inside and go you know this has got stuff to go with beer well let me try to see if I can get a uh, 
yeast culture to come off of it and pow because they've done that before in fact they've actually regenerated beers in that way somebody's out there making a couple of different uh sumerian beers here of course whenever they first came out they were talking that it was the oldest beer da 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 beer recipe so on but uh, no Generally, though, Natufians exploded wild cereals and hunted animals, including gazelles, Ar Ar archaeogenetics have revealed derivation of later Neolithic Bronze Age Levantines, primarily from Natufians, besides substantial admixture from Chalcolithic Anatolians. Well, what this is, is uh, there was one wave that I've talked about before that comes down, but then about 65, between 69 and 6,500, there ends up being a successive way that comes down. And these are light-haired, blue-eyed people. In fact, I did a video about how, hey, you know, coming down through the, through the Holy Land. And it showed you some of those people that made up the ancient Egyptians too. But it's believed these people may or may not have had lighter hair. But they don't have the same gene thing that would be for blonde hair, so on, or blue eyes. But they may have had blue eyes. In fact, all of the early hunter-gatherers that they're made half up of in their genetics, all are shown to have blue eyes. And every one of these that they've looked at has ended up showing blue eyes. It's just not the same genetics that's actually the same one that most blue-eyed people are, are of today, that they say hooks up to somebody between... 6,500 and 10,000 years ago, there's somebody that broke out around the Black Sea area and then everybody that comes from blue eyes from that. Well, there's blue-eyed Sumerian statues, Egyptian, so on, and there it is in that wave and a secondary too. Well, let's get on to that. Now, Dorothy Garrod coined the term Matufian based on her excavations at Shabga Cave, and that was the original ones, and we heard about that in school and two other sites but lo and behold now there's a lot more and they've ended up hooking them up together and so uh there were precursor cultures and we're going to look at one called the kabaran industry here in a minute but uh put things in idea of a timeline that we're talking about I've shown this in a lot of videos but what we're looking at here is ages back kya I mean thousands years ago and that's what we're just going over years before present so we've got to get 2,000 years on us and then here we go and Iron Age Bronze Age Calcolithic strangely even all of these you know I'm fixing to make a video about the, how the fact of everything has changed in fact it's changing right in front of us now because the Iron Age seems to span almost 1800 years farther than it did before the Bronze Age does seem to be about the Bronze Age, but the Copper Age goes all the way into it. And the Bronze Age goes a little bit farther. But if we go all the way back here, we have pottery. And if we reach down to about the time we're talking about here, and the end of these people, where they don't end, they just turn into a different culture that they archaeologically say is a different culture one of which is the Egyptians, one of which is part of North Africa and the Levant, those Canaanites and so on. Anyhow, so they're a lot more related, and we'll get to that here in a minute, but there's the Natufians, and then there's the Kabaran that comes before that, and we're going to look at that because it goes back to cutting at 20,000 years over here. And this younger Dryas and the Natufians were rocking along, and started really doing great whenever this started going up during the bowling Elrod, which seems to be an event because it jumped from the Ice Age back up to even to what it is over here in a real short amount of time. And the usual sway is an angle, which I've showed many times at about the angle of my finger. Well, this is stretched out over time, so it ends up being like that. And so that's an overspike. In fact, if we take out the Younger Dryas event right there, we see it just comes back up at normal. Well, there. Comes back up normal. That's a pow. Anyhow. So back to it. So there's similarities between different cultures. And 
They also talk about how the Natufians practice the Ibermorasian and Capasian custom. These are Caucasians of North Africa all around the Mediterranean and in what we call the Maghreb. And people that are in what's known as the Green Sahara, back whenever the Sahara was green. So, uh, I guess to get to a point, I mean, there's a lot of things which you can just look at. They've redated this site. That's kind of the reason I pegged and decided to go back through this again and make the three-way connection with where these things come from and the origins of it. Because things that I were making, was making videos on just a few years ago that was considered, whoa, that's some kind of watchy hooey, is now well accepted. And uh, you can find it in wiki articles that are updated. In fact, I've done a lot of videos recently on just basically updated wiki articles on things that I did before and I go, hey, this is what they're leaving out, here's what they're leaving out. And it's almost like they watch my videos and they go, okay, make sure that's right. All right, yeah, oh, and they put it in there. But there are so many connectives. All these little letters here connect to papers and things like that that people are telling you exactly what they're saying here. It's pretty much quotes, if you will. And they're all downstairs. All the Ibid situations that a researcher usually shows. So, this is, uh, they tell you that uh, what this is, is the uses of plants farming basically first shows up and they, it ends up showing up in North Africa as a precursor to the development of true farming in the Fertile Crescent. But such scenarios are intense uses of plants having built up in North Africa as a precursor to the development of farming and it's highly speculative until North African archaeological evidence can be gathered. In fact, this is just a BS that somebody threw in here because it's already well known of the earliest farming that we can find in the Sahara and so on that people were doing before they kicked it in and made it into the Nile that we know. At just over 7,000. Whereas we just talked about there, I have another site up there that did get destroyed in that deal that they were already farming farming preemptive to that so uh, in fact Weiss and others have shown that the earliest known uses of plants in the Levant was 23,000 years ago and so we're gonna go back that far that's something that's amazingly we were able to to latch another hook into and pull that into closer time but things get sparse and conjectures and ideas and people start coming up with concepts of how it used to be and so on and it really only takes one or two little artifacts and all of a sudden things change like these stone bowls and the capability of these people who whenever I was a kid were taught were ugh but then we see Cro-Magnon man and stuff that he had way back when and it didn't really add up also the timeline of humanity and when people were still hominids and things that supposedly went linear didn't go anything like that either so they tried to find out the genetics and what they looked like or who are these people what well, anthropologist loring brace who i've shown a lot and egyptologist seven has shown a lot of stuff of but he cross analyzed the craniometric traits of natufian specimens with those of various ancient and modern people of the Near East and Africa, North Africa, and Sub-Saharans in Europe, and the late Pleistocene epipolithic Natufian sample was described as problematic. Due to its small size, it's only consisting of three males and one female, as well as the lack of comparative sample from the Natufians at that time, and putative descendants in the Neolithic Near East. So Brace observed that Natufian fossils laid somewhere in between those of the Niger-Congo speaking populations, which were the Bantu people, who really used to be living in a small jungle area that here and during the Bantu expansion, instead of going over to Egypt, 
just kind of hooked it and went down. Um, I'm pressing the uh, pygmies first and then into Khoisan lands. But uh, so he thought that they were somewhere between or there was a mix or something or maybe this was some missing link between the two, which he should, should may suggest to a sub-Saharan influence on their constitution. But subsequent ancient DNA analysis of Natufian remains by Lazardus and others in 2016 found the specimens instead were a mix of 50% basal Eurasian ancestral component and 50% Western Eurasian unknown hunter-gatherer population which is related to the European Western hunter-gatherers we talked about before and the blue-eyed people and so on so boom no definitely not although you'll hear keep people keep mentioning the first part as if the second part and the six other studies never happened for some reason but according to bar yosef and bell cohen it seems that certain pre-adaptive traits developed already by the carbaran and geometric carbaran populations of natufians within the mediterranean park forest back then it used to be something that could call it a park forest played an important role in the emergence of the new socio-economic system known as the Natufian culture. Now here at 45 minutes we're going to switch to a part two because it's probably going to go to that. I'll see if I can fit it all into one but I doubt it the way I'm not shutting up. So they have settlements all going through the orange area that we were looking at earlier and they have lithic art and they tell you that they've got a special type of flaking that they do for a little while and but it seems to be only in a portion of the population they have the Ansike Sakiri lovers a human figure here we're gonna look at all these pictures they show long-distance exchange perhaps of Anatolian obsidian shellfish from the Nile Valley so pretty different areas they show malachite beads and they still don't know where they got that from it isn't local epipaleolithic natufians carried pathinocarpic figs from africa to the south eastern corner of the fertile crescent back in 10,000 bc that is that wave before everybody keeps talking about that made the sumerians that a lot of people talk about and i do too but there's that one again who were they here's a uh, Parthenocarpic figs. Parthenocarpy means that uh, it's it comes out seedless, basically. Um, so the seedless figs that everybody knows are fantastic. And they took them from North Africa that was growing around there and transported them into the Fertile Crescent. And so you can see in the design here that they're showing. Let's see if I can zoom in on this without losing it. And so you see they show it Egypt and North Africa. And the island here is known for it too, but this whole Fertile Crescent here. So this is the Fertile Crescent containing the island. And that where they got them to is the far southeastern corner. So they had taken them from here and transported them down here. Johnny Appleseed. I did a video about it about three years ago. Had a whole little thing about Johnny Appleseed. So... There's rich bone industry, harpoons, hooks, limestones, everything. Uh, ostrich real sh shell containers have been found throughout the Negev Desert, right? So, but uh, the Negev and the Black Desert that's over there also shows a lot of uh, cattle crawls that they talk about that lead all the way into Yemen, that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of them leading all the way from Anatolia to there through what we call the Black Desert now. Strangely enough, they showed these people coming down through Egypt, and there are some in sub-Saharan Africa leading right out from that way, and people want to act ambiguous about it, but they look exactly the same. Well, there's no exactly the same to these. They're all wobbly-shaped and so on, but the method is the same thing that's there, and it's shown. And so it might redate a lot of things whenever people look into that. Again, the oldest brewery was found, with a residue of 13,000 year old beer in a pre prehistoric cave near Haifa in the Israel area. So 
Maybe we can skip on through this. Development of agriculture. They did have domesticated dogs, by the way, in Ain Mahala in Israel, dated to 12,000 B.C., and the remains of an elderly human and four- to five-month-old puppy were found buried together. And I did a video about that just recently, showing you that burial and where people had dogs and about dogs and man. And here's a burial with this lady with this puppy. That's it. Another Natufian site at the cave of Hyuman, humans were found to be buried with two canids. Genetics. They end up showing this E1B1 and variations of that and a large part of their population. So they talk about haplogroup E1B1 is found primarily in North Africans and in Sub-Saharan Africa. But where that actually comes from is from these people who were giving forth our autosomal DNA. These Natufians carried around 50% of the basal Eurasian BE and 50% of West Eurasian unknown hunter-gatherers and components. So, these people admixed those people that it talked about before into existence pretty much, or they kept the trait. It became so strong they became a people where you see that E1, B1, B trait that's so hooked up to Sub-Saharan Africans. And uh, they were slightly distinct, so there's little variations on a the theme there, from northern Anatolian populations that contributed to the peopling of Europe, who had a higher western hunter-gatherer uh, inferred ancestry. So variations on a the theme here and the people that came across in Europe, and they have a little bit of different variation, but also that's brought in with the Proto-Indo-Europeans into what we have in our modern day too, which is not really spoken about here. And uh, Natufians were strongly, uh, let's see, from Neolithic farmers, the Zagros Mountains were a mix of basal Eurasians up to 62% in Northern uh, Eurasians or a N E as it's referred. So this suggests that different strains of basal Eurasians contributed in Natufians and Zagros farmers, and we just showed how that blended on down there. And of course the Neolithic Avant is trapped in the middle of this. So is Anatolia. Real important, in fact. Well, there's Gobekli Tepe and so on. And we're fixing to get there in just a second, guys. I'm going to make you go to part two to do it, though. There's only a little bit more here. It won't be a full 45 minutes. Look at part two. It's in your top left-hand corner. Let me know what you think so far, but let me know what you think whenever I show you the rest of this. We're stopping right here and starting to go through some pictures and talk. Top left-hand corner. See you there. Peace.